You're listening to the Free of Free of Free of Free of Music podcast. To the Free of Music podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Free of Music podcast. The featured artist in this episode is Nick Polly. Nick is a young singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist coming from Denver, Colorado. He just kicked off his solo career with his newest single, Floatin'. Give it a listen. Stay tuned for a sneak preview and enjoy. My name is Nick Pauly. I'm from uh, Colorado Springs originally. And then I've been living in Denver for about the past five years now. And I uh, primarily play acoustic guitar and sing. And then I also play bass. Um, Right now, I'm working with the Movers and Shakers, playing bass with those guys, um, and then pursuing my own solo project and kind of just uh, collaborating with a bunch of different musicians on that. Tell me about that. Like, you know, what sort of spaces open up on your tracks? Because you, you sing. Yep. And you play guitar and bass. So, you know, what, what other uh, slots are available in one of your songs for collaboration? My buddy, uh, Justin, he plays keyboards on a lot of my stuff and then uh, lays down the MIDI drums as well. Um, And then just um, additional guitar parts from Ian, his brother. Nico Owens, he's another guy who I, or Owen, I think his last name is. uh, He plays on Odessa's drumline, one of their snare players, but... He's good friends with Justin and Ian, and I think he and I are going to get on a track here soon together. I played bass with those guys, and he was on drums. We played a a wedding for one of their friends a couple weeks ago, and we had never played together, and it just kind of came together in one rehearsal and seemed to gel. So Sweet. Sweet. There's not really a name for that. Your drum beats, they're primarily MIDI-based? For the stuff that I'm doing these days, yeah, it's mostly MIDI, pretty much just because I don't have a good setup to uh, record a drummer. I've got a bunch of buddies who play drums who I want to get on different tracks, but I feel like tracking a full drum kit, you need like a really good room to do it right. And we don't really have access to like a sound treated room that would be good for acoustic drums at least at the spot where I've been uh, recording down in Springs. That makes sense. Now, when you're getting the MIDI drums, are you using beat pads or are they keyboard? So what we'll normally do is go and kind of like create a framework of it, just kind of like drawing the uh, MIDI by hand type of thing. And then once we have the idea down, we'll go back on the keyboard and give it kind of more of that live feel. I got you. So you kind of map it out with your mouse and keyboard, I mean, or mouse and clicker. Yeah. And uh, draw it and then go back in with a keyboard, which gives it a more human feel. Now, if you're not too familiar with music, one of the benefits of doing it this way is that you get some of that velocity information so that you get some of that feel and the timing's a little different unless you quantize it. You know, it's it gets that more human characteristic. It doesn't sound you know, is robotic. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. So one more thing, when you're recording your guitar, how, how are you doing it? Or what instruments are you recording audio from? Your voice is one. Yeah. So vocals, electric guitar, at least for like the stuff that I've been working on these days. When I'm like, Doing home recording, I'll uh, record bass myself and then acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and then like lay down MIDI. Because I've been working on a couple things, a couple songs uh, just on my own, trying to produce them myself. It's pretty interesting to go through the whole process of like learning the production side of it as well as trying to layer all of it yourself, you know? Yeah, and so when did you start that? journey or learning uh audio production yeah yeah um tracking it yourself because it's one thing to you know play a song but it's another thing to record it yeah 
Um, so I think the first time I actually ever recorded a song, I was probably like 14 on Audacity with like one of those $20 USB white microphones that they used to have. Nice. And, uh, you know, downloaded it with dial up and all that. <laughs> cool. Nice. And, uh, what, what, uh, software are you using these days? The stuff I use to record myself, um, is mostly Logic Pro. With the Gregory brothers who I've been recording with, those guys use uh, Pro Tools primarily. Okay, so Logic and Pro Tools. Yeah. So your first album, did you uh, record it yourself or where did you record it? Um, I recorded that with uh, Tyler Unland. He was the drummer for uh, Late Night Radio. I'm trying to think, he played with Ill Mannered back then. So he had a house out in the mountains, like west of Boulder, and so that's where I went and did my uh, my first solo album. I think I was 20, yeah, I was 20 when I wrote and recorded all of it, and um, 21 when I released that one. Another one that I did with uh, Justin and Ian, um, that was for Ian's audio production class that he was taking at uh, UCCS. Nice. Yeah, so he just had to mix and master a song, so we went down there and just kind of cut it in. We were running late, as musicians normally do, and so we had to cut it in, like, one take and everything. Yeah, so all the vocals on there are live. All of the acoustic guitar, drums, bass, and keyboards are live, and then the saxophone and lead guitar are also live, but they tracked that directly after we tracked ours. Nice. And just for everybody listening, what song is this? It's called uh, Floatin'. Floatin'. Yeah. It's and a really it, nice vibe. I like that song. It's it's a easy listen. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like one of those really ethereal, I don't know, Floatin' is a, a, yeah. an appropriate name for how floaty it kind of is, you know, just... Now, where did the song come from? How did it start? So I was in kind of like a transitional period in general. I was playing with a band, Offbeat Revolution. It was like me and all my best friends from high school. We like moved in together in Fort Collins and we were getting some traction and then things just kind of imploded like they normally do with many a band. Yeah, so that was right when I was starting my solo project up. And I just kind of felt like directionless. So I was like, that's the first line of the song is floating through time and space again. Floating through time and space again. Space will always win. Cause you know time is hard to find. And so that was where that line kind of came from. Yeah, the lyrics in general are kind of just about like finding your place and like your purpose and kind of taking a moment to contemplate about that and like get in touch with more of that side of things. Nice. And so this is ultimately your, your transition to your solo. Is that, is that what the song kind of reflects? Or um, so I actually, it's funny. I wrote the song the night that I got home from recording Light on the Other Side. So I'd recorded the whole album, and then it's kind of counterintuitive because it's like I had just busted my ass and done, like, worked, like, 50 hours in four days or whatever it was, like. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just interesting that, like, that came out of it because it's... um. You would think at that at that moment it would be like fuck yeah I'm just relax yeah like I just nailed this but it was more like huh why don't I feel more like that so I don't know it's a good it's a good song if you're kind of just like you said it's easy listening but at the same time kind of like a good reflective song too. When life gets too real, can't take what's inside. Don't 
Typically, when you're writing a song, how does it come to be? Is it lyric first, or is it case by case? Yeah, it's pretty much case by case. Like this new uh, single that I was that I've been working on, I actually wrote the lyrics to that one while I was driving. Um, like voice texted it into my phone, <laughs> and then went home and like kind of wrote the framework of the chords around it from there. You're capturing your ideas no matter where you are. Yeah, and, that's the and beauty no matter of... with what you've got. So if you've got a pen and paper, you'd use that. If you got an iPhone and audio recorder, you use that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and then you go back and and then do it right mm -hmm. um, in order to get a better sound. But yeah. that's but that's a great great uh, insight that you've got to be ready to kind of capture your ideas as they come because who knows when and where that'll be. Yeah, and like you said, that's the the beauty of the digital age and having, you know, the ability to just at any moment write down your thoughts and your notes on your phone or just, you know, take a little voice memo or whatever and go back to it hours later when you actually have your instrument and your, you know, pen and paper in front of you. Tell me about your performances, uh, at least solo performances. How do you present on stage? I guess it depends on the venue and the crowd and if it's with, you know, a band or just me and a guitar. I haven't played too many big shows just as a solo act without a band with me. But yeah, mostly it's just kind of like a more singer-songwriter-esque type of set. You know, I'll talk more in between the songs and explain the songs more and yeah it's oftentimes I'll use like a loop pedal too and kind of lay down like the framework of of the backbeat of it like on the guitar itself I'll lay down the percussive elements of it and then uh, pop like a phaser pedal on and kind of get like the bass tone you know layer on top of that just the chords and then solo over that and then you kind of have the ability to, you know, you could lay down a verse on the loop pedal and sing over that. Then you, you know, stop the, the verse, strum the chorus and sing, then come back in with the, the loop. And it kind of gives it like that cool effect of having more than just one, a dude with an acoustic guitar, you know. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Now, where did you learn some of these techniques with the loop pedal? My living room. Nice, <laughs> nice. Back when I was living in uh, Colorado Springs, when I was like 21. Yeah, I was probably like sitting around looping for like three or four hours every single day. And and the nature of the loop pedal is that it's going to be different tomorrow, even if you try and play it identically. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean... You're human, you're not a machine, and yeah. it's gonna be different. So do you ever just find yourself on stage like, whoa, I didn't expect that, you know, to go that way, or, you know, I didn't mean to hit the note there, but maybe it works or maybe it doesn't. How do you deal with those situations? Yeah, with with the loop pedal, I think the worst one is when you try and stop it and you're expecting it to stop. And I don't know what it is about my looper. Sometimes the pedal won't stop it so I'll try to transition and then it's like keeps going for an extra measure and I'm like oh shit well I was supposed to be eight bars but now it's nine and a half and <laughs> so it's all wonky but that's kind of the beauty of playing by yourself too though is you can recover from a lot of that stuff if you kind of call yourself out on stage in a way or just laugh it off or just visibly play it as if it was part of it yeah, like you said on. yeah yeah because you know, music is such a fleeting thing. Like, at the end of a set, no one's going to be like, damn, do you remember that, you know, B flat that he hit when it should have been a yeah, a G or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in music, especially if you're playing by yourself, you do have a lot of freedom. So like you said, maybe it's supposed to be eight, and then it continues on, and you're like, well, whatever, I'll let it go for 16. Kind of give yourself the space to work with. Now, a loop pedal... It's typically layering. You layer on, and then you kind of take out. Now, when you're playing with a band, that's entirely different because everything can change simultaneously. 
you know, dynamic way. When you're recording, how many people are you recording with? So I'm actually going to do a session today with the movers and shakers. We're going to try it live tracking with four of us. So we're going to have our lead singer, our guitarist, and then our drummer and myself on bass. And we, you know, soundproofed our our jam room the other day and made some like homemade baffles and stuff. Nice. So, yeah, it should be pretty cool to see how that goes. When I record track record stuff for like my solo project, that's normally just primarily with myself and um, Justin and Ian. Yeah, so it's either, you know, recording it myself on Logic, recording it with the movers and shakers, that's also going to be on Logic. And then, oh yeah, my buddy Alex Goldberg, longtime friend of mine, he played bass on the single as well. Now, when you're recording your guitar, are you... Tell me about like the signal flow. I mean, I'm, a, I'm kind of a nerd audio engineer guy. Mm-hmm. So are you recording the amp with a microphone? Are you recording directly out of the, the uh, instrument? Or are you going through a pedal? Or are you kind of splitting the signal? Are you getting multiple? For acoustic guitar, what I normally do is uh, I have an acoustic electric. So I will I'll put like a condenser mic, you know, maybe a foot back off of the 12th fret if we're going to get super nerdy yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah. And nice. then, so yeah, I'll keep that as kind of like the channel that I'm going to have more of like a wet sound on and then just kind of have like the line in be more of a dirty channel and then mix those together and it gives it kind of more of a full bodied sound if you like pan them, you know, okay. right and left. Interesting. And now are you going to the extremes or are you just like panning like, 10% or 15, 20% each one? I guess it depends on the song and okay, how, just how many kind of layers. Hear and, it out. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you do two overdubs, or like, you know, an original track and an overdub with two channels on each, then you have four to work with. So you could essentially play the same part twice and then pan them, you know, separately inverse to each other and get like a really cool stereo image oh, I, from it. I see what you're saying and they're two different takes so sonically they're truly different mm-hmm. um that's interesting i like that idea uh well thanks for sharing yeah and what about uh bass kind of similar um i always just run well, that I mean, directly bass, into the, the interface electric bass is hard to pick up on the microphone yeah you can't really uh so you're just running direct in mm-hmm. okay not through the amp? I think today we might actually try and do it through the amp with uh, the movers and shakers. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, it's always a, a fun thing to experiment with, and each each different technique has its own sound. There's not one necessarily right way to do it. It's all about what's relevant or how it sounds. Definitely. So you guys are going to be recording all together, uh, the four of you. Is that correct? Yep. Four. Um, and... Uh, after you record the four of you, is that a finished after product after you you know EQ and polish it, or are you gonna add more layers afterwards? Um, yeah, so we have a trumpet and a sax player as well. There's also like a three or four part harmony on like the hook of the song. Nice. It's a it's a pretty cool song. I'm pretty excited for it, man. It's called Loving You Less, and it's almost like. You know uh, the staple singers? I'll take you there. I'll take you there. <laughs> nice. It's like a super old school. Okay. Cool. But yeah, it's just got like a super kind of soulful hook to it. And um, yeah, man. Tell me about yourself as a kid. What brought you towards music? Actually, I played a lot of sports growing up, but I always like played music as well. What, um, what sports? I played uh, basketball and then ran cross country in high school. Kind of when I stopped playing basketball is when I really played more guitar in general. But um, yeah, I've kind of been fed music my whole life, so to speak. Like my mom put me in uh, this thing called kinder music when I was like two or three years old. And I'm not even sure what it taught me if it was just percussion or 
you know, I don't remember yeah, since I was three, knows? but, um, <laughs> you know, I started doing uh, piano lessons and played violin and orchestra in fourth grade, clarinet in sixth and seventh grade, or fifth and sixth, and then, you and know, puberty kicks in and you're like, fuck clarinet, I'm going to play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Like, girls don't like clarinet. <laughs> I need to write uh, songs good. and play an acoustic guitar. That's funny. <laughs> so, uh, you know, initially, I mean, getting your hands on a violin, I mean, I think uh, a lot of kids, at least in America, played recorder. I mean, we kind of had to. Yeah. Um, at least I did. Uh, I definitely but did, But how did you get on a violin? Was it? Did your family hook you up with a violin? So at my elementary school, we just, you know, had an orchestra that you could join in fourth grade. Wow, yeah. that's young. That's young. Yeah, so I just kind of like, I don't remember why I chose violin. Yeah, but you just grabbed it and made some yeah. noise. That's cool. Yeah, I would love to pick it back up, actually. I just haven't even, like I play mandolin, so I'd be able to kind of figure it out since it's a similar structure. It's essentially a fretless mandolin without eight strings, you know, without the pairs of two on there. Okay, so fourth grade orchestra. Mm -hmm. Then were there any other, like, kind of pivotal or interesting career-determining moves or uh, influences that you had, teachers or classes that you took? Yeah, I would say my first uh, guitar teacher definitely was a huge inspiration. Like, his biggest piece of advice that always stuck with me was don't make yourself just a guitar player. Like, make sure you can sing, because even if you're, like, a backup in a band, people want someone who can sing as well. And so he was like, you know, sing in the shower, sing at church, sing in the car, just sing all the time. And when you're playing guitar, sing with it. And so I'm I'm glad that he kind of instilled that in me, because it, I don't know, I feel like I was not a great singer when I started, and uh, it took a lot of uh, hours just sitting there grinding it out. And your roommates are just sitting there grinding it out with you? With yeah. Your earplugs or something? Well, that was I my parents oh, at that the was time. Your, oh, that's nice. Because by the time I was, you know, 17 or 18, I had been singing for a long time, and okay. I, feel, I felt, you know... But that's, that's awesome to, you know, you got to feel confident and you got to work through it. I don't think anybody's born excellent singer. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, I think it takes a lot of work. Yeah, and your, your body's your instrument, you know, and there's like so many things to factor in when you're singing. I've seen uh, some of your social accounts have some videos of you singing and playing. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of new kind of apps out there that you can get tips as you play and uh, Instagram there's the videos now are you finding that you're able to connect with people through those videos yeah I mean I feel like I've definitely gotten some good responses from just various people on there you know I think one thing that's helped a lot is just kind of engaging with other people on there I don't know. The coolest part to me has been just having like the artists who I've done covers of comment on it and be like, great job. Thanks for covering this, you know? Oh, that's awesome. And so that's like... Full circle. Yeah, yeah. That's like what you would hope to happen is the person is honored that you're doing it. And then at some point, it's like their fans become your fans because of the crossover. Yeah, primarily I just have covers on there right now, but I definitely want to start putting more of uh, my original stuff up yeah. and getting some higher quality videos because a lot of those were done just on my phone. But yeah, Ryan, the guitar player in uh, The Movers and Shakers, my roommate, he is a photojournalism major and he's really good with videography. So we're trying to do some like live videos at our spot down in Denver. And so hopefully I'll be able to do like more high quality videos in that nice. regard with him. I mean, I don't even think that they need to be like, you know, super flossy, you know, like Nike, yeah. Nike ads, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a one minute Instagram video. Yeah, so yeah, and I think it's, it also just like sheds light. It uh, 
demystifies who you are. It, it shows your face, it shows your personality and how you play and how you present yourself and how you sing. And it really kind of opens up the door. And I think people can kind of understand who you are. It helped us connect yeah. some of your videos and uh, you reaching out. And I think those videos are, are very underutilized by most people. Mm -hmm. And some artists out there, and I don't, I can't think of the platforms off the top of my head, but there's some like video tip platforms. Like some people will be busking or playing out on the street for money mm -hmm. and they'll set up a camera as well. And they'll have it live streaming on these services where you can get tips. Mm. And so they get digital tips as they're playing on the street for people who give them, you know, in-person tips. And it's just some super clever ideas yeah, using video. And, and you're using video, I just, you know, might as well share. And some of these uh, individuals who are just crushing it on video platforms make a surprising amount of money. I'll forward some articles or keep them in the show notes so that everybody can read about it. And so you're doing great with the videos. You know, beyond, beyond what you've done in the past, where do you kind of see yourself moving forward? You know, or are, are you working on any new albums? Yeah, so I've got a couple things in the works. Um, the main thing that I've been devoting a lot of energy to is uh, this, the solo single that I'm putting out. It's called The Million Times. Yeah, that should be out in the next couple months. I'm in Denver for now, but I also have had a itch to move out to the West Coast for a long time. Where are you thinking? Maybe somewhere near like LA, south of LA, like Costa Mesa or Huntington Beach. Nice. Huntington Beach is amazing. Yeah. And it's actually crazy, it's man. It's like similar to Denver rent prices. Like, oh, really? You know, five blocks from the beach down there. Yeah. I almost moved out there like back in November, but I ended up just, it ended up falling into place that Ryan needed a bass player and nice. I actually didn't even play bass that much. I mean, I had picked it up a couple of times here and there, but it was like California or stay and commit to doing this full time. New instrument. Yeah. And oh, just that's cool. the new project and stuff. And it, it's probably for the best that I stayed. Nice. But and California is still yeah. there, so yep. you, you got until it falls off into the ocean. Yeah. That's awesome that you started out in that like two or three year old preschool yeah. music class. I mean, who knows really what they do. I I went to one with my nephew and they just gave the kids a bunch of shakers and uh, tambourines yeah. and stuff and people were making noise and then they tried to get them kind of on a tempo and you know there was no wrong note to be played, but, mm -hmm. but everybody had a good time, at least the kids. You mentioned some of your high school interesting performances. There's one that involved a casino and breaking the law. Oh, so that was actually, yeah, I was uh, 20, yeah, 19 or 20 at the time. Entered a 21 plus Battle of the Bands and lied about my birthday on the entry submission online, got a bunch of people to vote for it. And so anyways, I got a spot and it was at this casino up in uh, Black Hawk. And I take a bus up there, it's a two-way bus for the artist. It was like 6 p.m. and then the other bus didn't go back until 1 a.m. So I've got, you know, a big ass pedal board, my acoustic guitar and an amp. And, you know, I walk up to the door with my hands just packed and they're like, can we see your ID? I was like, well, you know, I'm with the competition. And they're <laughs> like, no, let's see your ID. And they wouldn't even let me stay on the premises. So I'm standing out there. It was like November. You know, snowing. And up this in is Black Colorado, Hawk. and it's high elevation. Yeah. This is in the mountains. Yeah, I'm like, okay, well, I've got my guitar, my amp, and my pedal board, and seven hours to kill where I'm not allowed on the premises of <laughs> any place up here. <laughs> so, so I take it uh, you didn't win that competition. No, no. okay, it, it Sh won me almost. for sure. <laughs> so what'd you do? What'd you do? Um, I remember chilling in like a covered bus stop for like a couple hours, probably chain smoking cigarettes or something, uh, just bummed that's out. Rough one. <laughs> that's it funny. was definitely a Johnny Cash moment. I think the worst um, 
under 21 denial that I ever had was uh, driving out to Salt Lake City. And I drove eight hours with my buddy. We get to the venue, same type of thing. Like I walk up to the door and she's like, we need you to get off the premises because you're not 21. And the, the promoter, like, I called him up on the phone. I was like, dude, what the hell? Like, I just drove eight hours to get here. And he was like, you should have told me you were 21, blah, blah, blah. And it was cool. We ended up staying in Utah for like five days or something. But just kind of one of those moments where it was a little bit yeah, demoralizing. The door, door slammed on your face when you're trying to walk in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It was the woodshed and Salt Lake. So tell me about your first ever musical performance. My first ever. That you can remember. It's funny. I like, I was super shy as a kid. And I actually remember at my first piano recital, I quite literally, when they called my name, just like hopped underneath my chair, you know, got on the floor and was like, fuck this. <laughs> like, <laughs> Hiding. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, dude. I so was, you didn't get on stage that day? No, I didn't. Okay. And then like a year later, I had a piano recital and I felt super comfortable and was fine with it. But it was funny. It was just like that. I was probably like four or five, though. So it was kind of Yeah, but it's just daunting. It's something that you didn't want to do. Yeah, it was weird. And yeah. then a couple of years later, I'm playing in a band fronting it. So I started... Um, the band that became Offbeat Revolution, like me and my buddies started that in seventh or eighth grade. Like my buddy Alex, who plays bass with uh, the Austin, or he played with the Austin Young Band, and now he plays with Chris Daniels and the Kings. Uh, we grew up together, and so he and I started that project in like seventh grade. But that's a okay. great, great story, though, the initial one. I, I can just totally visualize you jumping under the chair. <laughs> but uh, but that's encouragement to everybody out there. I mean, you don't have to be a natural on stage. You can yeah. be nervous. Uh, you know, you can be shaky on stage. It's, you know, you got to kind of get over it yeah, and uh, get out from under the chair and yeah. <laughs> and take a stab at it. Try to. I mean. Pull yourself up from yeah. your the bootstraps yeah. out from under the chair and, <laughs> <laughs> and keep going and give it another try. I mean, the first show, that's not the predictor of life, you know, uh, keep, keep going. Yeah. And so that's awesome. All right. Now about the first time you ever got paid for music. First time I ever got paid to play music, I think was my friend Elena's quinceanera growing up 15 years old, probably made like 50 bucks or something. But um, was it a game changer for you? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the first time I made like actual decent money. I mean, I think that, you know, playing with Offbeat Revolution in high school, we didn't make a ton of money, but there were some bar gigs where it was like a $300 guarantee and we're like three 17 year old kids. So yeah, it was kind of cool. awesome. And that's a, a you know high pay per hour, but that doesn't that's not to take away from the fact that you put in hundreds or thousands of hours playing yeah. before then. So definitely, uh, you know, just for everybody out there, just thinking about you know paying a musician, it's not it's not about how long they're on stage. Uh, you know, it's their life that they put into their work. So um, just keep that in mind next time you're hiring somebody. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's funny because there's like kind of this inverse thing of like size of the size of the show the smaller the show the better it pays and the bigger it is the less you get paid that's been my experience thus far like i've made way more playing random bar gigs than i ever have playing the bluebird or the gothic or the aggie or any of those you know because that those are all like consignment deals with tickets where you have to hustle pre-sales and all that type of stuff yeah, and, and basically you're renting the venue, is that correct? What's consignment? Um, so Educate me. <laughs> so uh, consignment tickets are where, like, you... So say, you know, a show is $15 pre-sale, 18-day of show or something like that. Okay. They'll give you a bunch of $15 tickets, and, you know, you'll get $7 off of every $15 ticket that you sell. 
or something like that. Um, so you know, basically, you need to hustle yourself each and every ticket, and you get paid seven dollars per ticket. Yeah, if yeah, if it's a fifty-fifty-ish split, yeah. seven fifty or whatever, it's always better if you can get a guarantee because then it's a lot, a lot less hustle. I mean, you still want to promote it the same way, but like I feel like when you have to hustle consignment tickets, you're like bugging your friends and like yeah. hitting up people who you haven't talked to in years just to try and like pad your numbers because like some promoters judging you and like trying to be like oh can you draw x amount of people it's like yeah if i text three times as many people as that and piss them all off <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and somebody will nag reply. them to, yeah. <laughs> to come yeah i know what you mean, it's more of a hustle for sure yeah and it's nice to have that guarantee is less risk it's just uh, more peace of mind, I would say, going into that show. Yeah, definitely. It's just you know, you're not worried about the numbers, hopefully, because you've uh, they're you're, already kind of they're already there. yeah, you've already got a guarantee, and you've already know that you've put in your work. And all right, so once you're at uh, playing live, working with fans, uh, hooking them up with uh, apparel and stickers and CDs and and whatever you got, and how do you grow that fan base? With those guys, we've got like uh, sunglasses and shirts and CDs, you know, your standard yeah. earrings, guitar picks. But it's, I think it's super important to keep in mind because, you know, you get the guarantee, but then you get a little bonus on top of it. Yeah. And people are walking around wearing shades with your band name on it, spreading the word. Definitely. And yeah, I'm actually about to... Uh, do my first order of Nick Pauly shirts that I've ever done, which Sweet. I'm pretty stoked on. All right. Well, you'll have to share the link with us, and we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. What is uh, what has been one of your biggest challenges to date at being a musician, putting yourself out there, putting your art in front of other people? I would say the hardest part of being a musician is dealing with other musicians. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's like, you know, if you're in a band with four people, it's like having three girlfriends and you can't have sex with any of them. <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I think I, just interpersonal stuff is always interesting with creative people because you, uh, cause you're sharing like that artistic part of it, the business side, you know, if you're living with someone that adds a whole nother dynamic onto it. So it's like. And, you know, it's awesome with the situation that I have now with Ryan because, like, I had kind of sworn off living with bandmates in the past. And then, like, with Ryan, I was, had no doubt in my mind that we were going to be fine and just, like, be good roommates and not have it come between anything in the band. It's, so just dealing with other creative people. I mean, it's hard and, to get everybody on the same track. Yeah. On the same page, same time, same day, same beat. Mm -hmm. same vibe yeah and I feel like that's really kind of something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is just like whether it's one person in the project having the vision and then kind of like making that apparent and then having other people just play the the music around that um, or having everyone on the same page about the vision it just has to be like a collective thing and you have to understand like you know, if someone's like, oh, I want to take this as far as I can, and that might mean something completely different to the other bandmate, you know. I feel like setting kind of like clear goals and just thinking about it from like a, you know, big picture framework of like where you want to take any given project, I think is a huge part of what either makes or breaks any, any given band. Well, it's certainly hard dealing with just different people creatively and trying to, to meld everybody's idea because, you know, two ideas may clash and then what? Mm -hmm. uh, so whose idea wins? You know, yeah. is, it, uh, is it a voting system? Is one idea better or does the leader's vision win? You know, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a tricky balance. Um, some other artists I've talked with talk about uh, collaborating on the computer and one person being in the hot seat. That's what they called it. Okay. You know, so they're in the, they're like behind the computer 
pushing the buttons, twisting the knobs, hitting the keyboard, and the other person kind of has to step back and just kind of relinquish some of that control momentarily. Yeah. And process that transitions, and then they switch sides. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because making music with somebody else, you kind of do have to step back at, to an extent and let the other person play their part. And it's yeah. hard, hard to still keep your own vision intact while letting other people add theirs. Definitely. It's a tricky balance. Yeah, and it's different for every project and every person you work with. And, you know, you kind of have to find that, like you said, the balance of letting other people put in their creative input while you're also, if you have an idea that, like, you know is definitely going to resonate with other people that maybe you're writing a song with someone and they don't hear that specific part you know i feel like it's it's good to have multiple heads together because then you can kind of feed off of the other one but yeah it's a delicate balance especially if you're writing music together now you're able to read music mm -hmm. and you you've kind of been classically trained is that right yeah, pretty, <clears throat> pretty much since, you know, orchestra in fourth grade, it's been, that was all through uh, public school. So you were reading music in fourth grade? Yeah. I was reading music, shit, whenever I started playing piano, so. so before fourth grade? Yeah, probably like second grade. That's amazing. Um, man, what an what a awesome uh, opportunity to be able to read, in my opinion, a foreign language. Yeah, it uh, definitely is. And be able to translate text into music. Yeah. But and it's I, awesome that you're able to do that. Are you are you writing down your ideas in musical notation? No, I actually haven't really ever transcribed something that way. One cool thing, new audio workstations and just different programs is that you're able to you know, lay something down on the keyboard in like Logic, you know, and play a C chord and then have it lay, you know, on the actual uh, yeah, music. It shows the score on yeah, Logic. Yeah, you exactly. push a button and you, you can push as many random keys as you want and it will make it into written notation for you. Yeah, exactly. Which is pretty cool. So that's an interesting way that I think maybe I could learn kind of kinesthetically, you know, by mm -hmm. doing it. And, uh, but that's, that's a good point. You know, technology certainly helps in these aspects. Yeah. And I think one of the challenging things about like reading music on guitar versus like piano is with, with the keyboard or piano, you've got theory laid out in a roadmap right in front of you in a way that makes a lot of sense and there's only one place to play a middle C on a a keyboard, you know, but like that same C on a guitar, there's four places you can play it. And so you have to not only think about it from a note standpoint, but from like a position on the neck standpoint and how you work that into other pieces of the written music. Like I think the hardest song I ever had to learn reading music was um Charlie Parker, damn, I can't. I don't know yeah, why I can't remember the name. But. It's all good. It was Charlie Parker. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that counts. <laughs> that um, counts. Cool. So, all right, just kind of uh, wrapping up. Where can our listeners hear your music and follow you on social networks? Any links? On Instagram, it's just at Nick Polly Music is the uh, handle on there. I actually don't use Twitter. Spell that out. Just um, make sure. N i c k p a u l y music, with just the regular spelling of music. Yeah. No z's or k's or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then nickpolly.bandcamp.com is where I have all my music that's currently up. And then within the next couple weeks, I'll have my, I'll probably have floating, and then. Light on the Other Side, which is my first solo EP. I'll probably get those on Spotify and iTunes and everything because I want to get my uh, distribution going for a million times, the new single. So 
I think if I can kind of get set up on TuneCore or CD Baby and get it on all those platforms, it'll be good to do that because I never actually went back and did that back in the day. Nice. So, yeah, it should be on any major music platform, and then the new single will definitely be on iTunes and Spotify and all of that within, you know, the next month from now probably. Is there any piece of advice that you'd give to a musician starting out today, somebody, you know, maybe a a little younger uh, that you would give some encouragement to? Um, Yeah, I mean, I would say I guess if you're a young musician, the most important thing is just to keep grinding it out, you know, and especially if you're a musician in Denver, like it's a just a fertile place for music right now, and there's so many good musicians and good resources and like you know if you go down to Cervantes any given night there's like a really you know badass player from one of the awesome bands around town just kind of chilling there you know like and so I feel like in Denver one thing you have to do is just like embrace the scene that's around you and it's just it's cool to see how vibrant it is right now and I think there's a lot of opportunity in a lot of different genres and the most important thing though is just you know practice your instrument as much as you can and just never stop you know networking and grinding and practicing has to be a lifestyle you know how do you make that transition from being a listener and you know fan of going to concerts to being on stage and playing some of those shows at some of those venues that might be in your local area how did you make that transition okay yeah I mean I think that was mostly just from like building um the the brand with Red Sage the the project that I was playing with before um but that was primarily just from you know, being professional and hitting a bunch of people up and, you know, always networking, always trying to get people to come to the shows and then showing up on time, not being drunk. And <laughs> there's yeah. just so many, there's so many like little nuances to it where it's like people think that it's just a, a huge party or whatever, or it's like just going to be a easy thing or you got to show up clean-minded yeah, and ready yeah. to perform. Yeah, exactly. Ready to lay it down or to be recorded. or. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, I think that just being professional and friendly and just making a lot of friends and not burning bridges is, like, really how you start to establish yourself more. And, yeah, just you have to back it up by being good at what you do, you know, nice. on stage. Well, great. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share? The Movers and Shakers, I'll plug our... We have a pretty big show coming up on uh, September 14th at the Mishawaka Amphitheater. It's with uh, Here Come the Mummies. They're a bunch of, like, L.A. studio cats who, like, wrap themselves up in mummy garb, and then they'll just, like, feature random other famous musicians and rap. You know, they're all wrapped up, so there's, like, this whole, like, Who's who? anonymity factor to it. Yeah, and uh, I guess at one of their shows within the past couple months, they had, like, Dominic from uh, Big Gigantic come play sax as a mummy and, you know, stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see if they feature anyone that night. Yeah, that'll be a really cool opportunity. I've always wanted to play that venue probably the prettiest venue in Colorado. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. We did it. We done it. Don't try to get away. It's all in your mind. been listening to the Frio Music Podcast with Michael Morahan. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And don't forget to share this podcast 
everywhere. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay tuned. Free your music, free your music, free your music, free your music. You are listening to free your music.